hello again. We will now take a slightly broader and more in-depth look at some of the established principles relating to the exercise of discretionary powers. As I noted in the last video, these long-established principles still matter because they form part of the legal constraints according to which the decisions of administrative bodies must be justified. In other words, they haven't been supplanted, but rather have been folded into reasonableness review post Vavilov. We have already looked at the principle that where a decision maker enjoys a discretionary power, that power must be exercised in line with the overall purpose of the legislation. We saw this principle applied in the case of Ron Carelli versus Duplessis. There is a closely related doctrine, that of taking account of improper considerations. These long-standing principles relating to the review of discretionary powers could be said to run together under a heading of relevancy, or perhaps purpose and relevancy. It might be a fairly subtle matter of advocacy choice whether you want to found a complaint in the doctrine of improper purpose or impro irrelevant considerations. As I will now illustrate, some of the most controversial applications of the principle of purpose and relevancy, both in the UK and in Canada, is where a discretionary power has been exercised to express moral or political disapproval of a particular body or its conduct. A good example of this is Shell Canada Product Limited versus Vancouver City. This was a 1994 decision and relates to the events that happened at the end of the apartheid era in South Africa. At the time, there was a widespread boycott of South Africa, incorporating trade, sports and cultural affairs amongst other things. If you're a music fan, you may know that Paul Simon's album Graceland was made with South African musicians, and this attracted strong criticism in some quarters. Anyway, Shell had continued to do business with the regime in South Africa. The city of Vancouver sought to exercise its municipal powers not to do business with Shell, and to declare the city a Shell-free zone until the oil companies stopped doing business in South Africa, including exporting sulphur via the port of Vancouver for sale to South Africa. Shell, as you can imagine, were rather put out by this and they challenged the Vancouver city ordinances by way of judicial review. And the majority in a decision but given by Justice Sapinka held that the ordinances were unlawful. This was not because Vancouver did not have the power to do the things that it sought to do, for example, to make up its mind whom it would purchase petroleum products from, but because it sought to do those things for an improper purpose. Or equally, I suppose you could say that their decision was based on irrelevant considerations. Justice Sapinka based this decision on a distinction between matters which were internal to the governance of the city and what he called matters external to the interests of citizens. The city was permitted to take measures conducive to its good rule and government. This did not altogether prevent it from taking into consideration what went on beyond its city boundaries. But Vancouver's position on what went on thousands of miles away in South Africa, just as Supinka thought, did not have its pur purpose the benefits of the citizens of the city. It is worth reflecting also on the opinion of the minority in this close 5-4 decision. For the minority, the interests of citizens could not be defined so narrowly. As Justice McLachlan put it in his dissenting judgment, the term welfare of citizens, it seems to me, is capable of embracing not only their immediate needs, but also the psychological welfare of the citizens as members of a community who have an interest in expressing their identity as a community. Our language recognises this. We speak of civic spirit, of city pride. This suggests that city council may properly take measures relating to fostering and maintaining this sense of community identity and pride. I think what this decision 
and the contending views of the majority and minority opinion emphasises is the difficulty that presents itself when the court is asked to review an agency or municipality's decision as to the proper purpose of its powers. What might be seen as an abuse of power isn't always as readily determined as in the case of Ron Carelli. To stress, post-Baker and post-Dunsmuir and Vavilov, such questions need to be approached using the proper standard of review, which is presumptively now reasonableness. I just wonder if a question like that in Shell Canada products might be decided differently, provided the city authorities lived up to a high standard of justification for the decision. In this context, I would like to mention one facet of an English case, Wheeler and Leicester City Council. This was also a case about the boycott of the South African apartheid regime. A rub the club had undertaken a tour of South Africa, and in response, Leicester City Council terminated its permission to use council-owned parkland on which to train. The case turned out similarly to the Canadian case, but what I want to point out is the fact that the council for Leicester City Council made an argument which I wonder if, had it been made by Vancouver, might have been more compelling. The argument was that Leicester City Council had a duty, and in the English local government context, a statutory duty, to promote good race relations within the city. It was argued, unsuccessfully, that good race relations demanded that the council express its disapproval of the club's decision to tour South Africa in defiance of a sporting and cultural boycott, and that the termination of the rugby club's right to train on city property was an appropriate way of doing so. As far as I can make out, this line of argument wasn't pursued by Vancouver's legal representation. That may be because it didn't persuade the courts in England, but in the light of the animating principle of deference in Canadian administrative law, I wonder if it might not have had more purchase in Canada. Had Vancouver's decision been justified along lines such as these, I wonder if it might meet Justice Supinka's requirement that a decision be for the purpose and benefit of its citizens, even if that notion were to be interpreted somewhat narrowly. Bear in mind that post Vavilov, the court must not substitute its reasoning for that of the primary decision maker and can only intervene if the decision-maker's reasons fails to reveal a rational change of analysis or a lack of justification according to the legal and factual constraints pertaining to the decision. I won't pursue this speculation any further here, but I hope it provides a basis for trying to think through how principles that were established pre-Vavilov might be modified at the margin as a result of that case. Instead, in the final section of this mini-lecture, I will briefly discuss some of the other principles that the courts have applied to the review of discretionary decisions. First, in my last lecture, I touched briefly on the principle of wrongful delegation. The basic idea is captured in the Latin maxim, delegatus non potest delegare. This translates roughly as the person to whom power is delegated cannot himself delegate. The key idea is that when Parliament or a legislature delegates power to an administrative body, it expects that it is that body and not some other which exercises that power. There are lots of exceptions to this, of course, the most important of which is when decisions of ministers are quite properly taken by civil servants. I will illustrate the core idea by reference to an English case of Barnard and National Dock Labour Board, a decision from the 1950s featuring a lead judgment by Lord Denning. Barnard and a number of his associates were dismissed from their positions in London's docks. They worked as dockers. The relevant legislation vested responsibility for disciplinary matters in local dock labour boards. But Barnard and his colleagues were dismissed not by the local dock labour committee, but by the dock manager. 
This violated the principle of wrongful delegation. It was significant, I think, that the local boards comprised representatives of management and labour, and so were set up to achieve a balance between the need for effective discipline in a large workforce and the need for fairness towards workers. Decision-making by a dock manager couldn't really ensure fairness in the same way. The principal in Barnard and a closely related case of Vine and National Dock Labour Board were applied in Canada in the case of driver, salesman, plant, warehouse and can cannery employees, local union number 987 of Alberta versus Alberta Board of Industrial Relations. That's a bit of a mouthful. A closely related principle, in fact, arguably part of the same principle of wrongful delegation, is the rule against acting under dictation. The core idea here is that if Parliament or a legislature vests decision-making authority to an administrative body, then that body cannot submit to the judgment of another in how it decides a particular matter. Again, I will illustrate this principle with an English case, Lavender and Minister of Housing and Local Government. Lavender applied for planning permission for sand and gravel extraction. In other words, Lavender wanted to turn a field into a quarry, for which the company needed planning permission from the local authority. The local authority refused and so Lavender appealed as they were entitled to do so under the relevant statute to the Minister of Housing and Local Government. Before hearing the appeal, the Minister was required to ask for objections, and he did receive one objection which came from the Minister of Agriculture. Now, there was no question that the Minister should hear the objection and could, at his own discretion, place great weight upon the point of view advanced by the Minister of Agriculture. But the Minister of Housing and Local Government went further. He made it clear that it was his policy to refuse to grant permission as long as the Minister of Agriculture objected. The court held that this was not a proper exercise of discretion. The Minister of Housing and Local Government was acting under the dictation of the Minister of Agriculture. Parliament expected the person in whom the discretion was vested to ex exercise his judgment and not to wrongfully delegate this discretion to another minister. This brings me to a final principle that I will mention in this video, the rule against fettering of discretion. Lavender could be seen as an illustration of this principle, just as it could be seen as an application of the rule against wrongful delegation. The principles connect, but there is another aspect of the no fettering doctrine which stands on its own two feet. The idea I am getting to is that where an administrative decision maker develops a policy and applies it too rigidly, that is a difficult idea because we very often imagine that good decision making involves the development of pro policies as to how the discretion should be exercised. This is part of what Kenneth Culp Davis called structuring of discretion. But the idea captured by the node fettering doctrine is that even though an administrative decision maker might well want to develop policies to structure its discretion, these should not be applied over rigidly. The administrative body should always be willing to listen to reasons why an exception to the policy might be justified in particular circumstances. The decision maker can develop and apply policies to particular cases, in other words, but must not close its ears to arguments why the policy does not fit a particular case. As Justice Ledane put it in the Federal Court of Appeal, in the case of Maple Lodge Farms versus Canada, the minister may validly and properly indicate the kind of considerations by which he will be guided as a general rule in the exercise of his discretion, but he cannot fetter his discretion by treating the guidelines as binding upon him and excluding other valid or relevant reasons for the exercise of his discretion.
This passage was quoted approvingly on appeal to the Supreme Court in that case. Incidentally, the passage draws heavily on the 1971 English case of British Oxygen Company and Minister of Technology. This concludes my fairly brief review of the older case law and administrative law principles on the exercise of discretion. It may come in handy, but let me conclude by emphasising one more time that the first port of call, if you like, in considering review of discretionary decisions is now the Vavilov guidance on conducting reasonableness review. However, the guidance of Vavilov does emphasise that a reasonable decision is one which takes account of the legal constraints on the decision. And the principles that I have just discussed, and there are others, this is just a brief sampling, do have continued relevance because they contribute to the legal constraints that the reasonable decision maker must take into account. And this also concludes my section of this pre-recorded lectures for Canadian administrative law. So from next week onwards, you'll be back in the safe hands of Sabrina. I'm sure you look forward to those lectures, and I look forward to seeing you in class. Goodbye.